My name is Robert Carnworth. I'm a Justice of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. I have a special interest in environmental law and I've been for some 15 years a member of a judicial task force set up by the United Nations Environment Programme to help improve the understanding of environmental law among judges across the world. I'm going to talk about the development of the concept of environmental law in a global society. The growth of modern environmental law dates from the late 1960s and early 1970s. Some have linked its emergence as a subject of global concern with the beginnings of space travel and the first photographs of our world from outside taken by the Apollo astronauts. Here are the opening words from the report Our Common Future by the highly influential Brundtland Commission in 1987. They said this, In the middle of the 20th century, we saw our planet from space for the first time. A small and fragile ball dominated not by human activity and edifice, but by a pattern of clouds, oceans, greenery and soils. Humanity's inability to fit its activities into that pattern is changing planetary systems fundamentally. This new reality from which there is no escape must be recognized and managed. Modern developments in astronomy have made us even more acutely aware of the extraordinary combination of chance events which made possible the conditions for life on this planet. They may be replicated somewhere among the billions of planetary systems which make up the universe but that is still pure speculation. We have an extraordinary obligation to guard and preserve this jewel which has been entrusted to us. It is no coincidence that it is over the last 50 years that we have seen the development of environmental law as a global responsibility. We have seen the rapid development of a new and complex system of laws giving effect to principles or common laws of the environment which are now shared by countries and regions across the world. This global system is a field of law that is international, national and transnational in character all at once. Of course, the seeds of environmental law, though not under that name, can be traced back much further. For the common law world, a good starting point might be the 19th century in United Kingdom, which saw the rapid development of the law in the courts and in Parliament to meet the serious challenges of the Industrial Revolution and the growth of urban populations. For example, in the Birmingham Corporation case of 1858, the court granted an injunction to stop the corporation pouring untreated effluent from its sewers into the River Thames. The strong line taken by the courts in such cases was in practice mitigated by the suspension of the injunctions on terms which gave the polluters, under the supervision of the court, both the incentive and the time needed to come up with effective technical solutions to their problems. Many important developments in the technology of pollution control flowed from that judicial process. As we shall see, there are close parallels between that process and the continuing mandamus developed by the Indian Supreme Court and other jurisdictions in more recent years. Such cases also led the way to the development of much stronger regulatory regimes, including the first comprehensive legislation in this field in the Great Public Health Act 1875 in the United Kingdom. That was the precursor of many that have followed and remains a foundation of much of modern environmental law in the UK as in elsewhere in the common law world. Moving forwards nearly a century and looking to the global picture, the famous Trail Smelter case in 1938 has been described as a crystallizing moment for international environmental law. It related to a complaint by the residents of the state of Washington about sulfur dioxide emissions from a smelter in Trail, British Columbia, across the border. The arbitral tribunal enunciated the now well-established principle that no state has a right to permit the use of its territory in such a manner as to cause injury to the territory of another. The involvement of the United Nations 
itself came much later. The United Nations Charter of 1945 made no mention of the environment. Not surprisingly, at that time, its primary concern was the maintenance of international peace and security. But its wider mission extended to problems of an economic, social, culture, cultural or humanitarian character. This provided a basis for the development of its environmental activities. The first major initiatives at United Nations level were the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment in 1972, and in the same year, the establishment of the United Nations Environment Programme, or UNEP. The 1972 Stockholm Declaration provided a set of general principles which, though not legally binding as such, have provided a framework for the later development of environmental law nationally and internationally. It was based on the shared responsibility of all to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. The following years saw a proliferation of laws and regulatory measures and environmental organizations at national and international level, including the beginnings of European environmental law. We had to wait for the Rio Declaration of 1992 for more flesh to be put on the bones of the Stockholm Declaration. Many of the principles there set out are now widely established in law and court practice, such as sustainable development, intergenerational equity, the precautionary principle, polluter pays, and so on. Of central importance was principle seven. It required all states to cooperate in a spirit of global partnership to conserve and restore the Earth's ecosystem. Their responsibilities were to be common but differentiated in recognition of their differing contributions to global environmental degradation and the differing technologies and resources available to them. The spirit of Principle 7 was seen in action in relation to the protection of the ozone layer. It is worth dwelling on this episode. It is a prime example of science, law and political action in harmony. It is also a success story which may offer lessons for the future. In the early 1970s, scientists warned that CFCs, then used in a wide variety of refrigerants and other industrial processes, had the potential to destroy the stratospheric ozone layer that protects the Earth from harmful ultraviolet radiation. In the following decade, scientists were able to document the build-up and long lifetime of CFCs in the atmosphere and find proof of their effects. The public and policymakers were motivated to take action. This led to the 1985 Vienna Convention on the Protection of the Ozone Layer, followed by the 1987 Mont Montreal Protocol on Ozone Depleting Substances. In the 30 years since then, the vast majority of ozone depleting chemicals have been phased out worldwide, and the stratospheric ozone layer appears to be on the way to recovery. Critical success was the respect paid to the differentiated interests and needs of developing countries, particularly to ensure access to resources and alternative technologies. Important also was the non-compliance procedure, Article 8, supervised by an implementation committee whose approach has been described as non-judicial and non-confrontational using sticks and carrots. Returning to the um, Rio Declaration, uh, no less important is Principle 10, the right to public participation. That has three pillars, as they are called, the right of the public to relevant information held by public authorities, the right to effective access to judicial and administrative proceedings to enforce those rights, and uh, the right to information. This simple tripartite formula has proved pervasive and highly effective. It has been given more elaborate and binding form in Europe in the Aarhus Convention, which has in turn been replicated in other parts of the world. An important aspect of Principle 10 is the widening of access to the courts to enforce environmental protection. The traditional view was that judicial review was confined to those with a specific legal interest in the subject matter of the case distinct from that of the public at large. However, in most parts of the common law world, that has rightly given way to a much broader approach. 
As my colleague in the Supreme Court, Lord Hope, said in a case in 2014, environmental law proceeds on the basis that the quality of the natural environment is of legitimate concern to everyone. Some courts have taken the logic of that a stage further. Thus, in the Philippine Supreme Court, in the famous Opposa case, mem the Supreme Court memorably upheld a challenge to the state's policies for the granting of consents to fell in the country's virgin forests, brought by some 43 children from all over the Philippines on behalf of themselves and generations yet unborn. At national level, environmental principles have found their way into new or amended constitutions. Constitutions dating from before this period made no explicit reference to the environment. However, from about 1990, some courts, notably in India and Pakistan, began to interpret general guarantees of the right to life as including not just the right to mere existence and conception to death, but also to the right to a healthy environment in which to live. <clears throat> By contrast with those earlier constitutions, nearly all those adopted since the early 1990s have explicitly recognized in some form the right to a clean and healthy environment. Such provisions take many forms. I take as a, an example Argentina's Article 41 adopted in 1994, which recognizes the correlative rights and duties of everyone. It provides all inhabitants enjoy the right to a healthful, balanced environment fit for human development so that productive activities satisfy current needs without compromising those of future generations and have the duty to preserve the environment. So also in human rights law, the European Convention on Human Rights dating from the immediate post-war period said nothing in terms about the environment. But in a series of cases starting in the mid-1990s, the European Court of Human Rights held that Article 8, which requires respect for private life and the home, extended also to the protection of the home environment. By contrast, the much later African Charter on Human and People's Rights of 1981 provided expressly in Article 24 that all peoples shall have the right to a general satisfactory environment favorable to their development. None of these developments in environmental laws would have been of much value unless the judges were themselves attuned to the same objectives. Again, we have come a long way in a short time. At the global level, the International Court of Justice has itself moved forward. In 1996, for the first time, it acknowledged the protection of the environment as part of international law. It spoke of the environment as not an abstraction, but the living space, the quality of life, and the very health of human beings, including generations unborn. A, la a year later, in the Hungarian Dams case, for the first time, it gave its express endorsement to the principle of sustainable development as part of international law. The central role of the judiciary received worldwide recognition in 2002 at the Global Judges Symposium in Johannesburg. It brought together senior judges from around 60 countries at the invitation of the United Nations Environment Programme. The Johannesburg Principles, adopted by the conference, affirm the vital role of an independent judiciary and judicial process and called for a UNEP-led programme of judicial training and exchange of information on environmental law. I was privileged to represent the UK judiciary on the Judicial Task Force set up by UNEP, based in Nairobi, which oversaw the development of that program. <clears throat> One of the most important developments of the last 20 years has been the growth of specialist environmental tribunals with wide powers to oversee and enforce laws for the protection of the environment. A study in 2011 identified a multiplicity of specialist environmental jurisdictions in 42 countries about half created in the previous five years. One of the most important has been the National Green Tribunal in India, established in 2010 under the strong leadership of a former Supreme Court Justice, Swatanta Kumar. In China, the first environmental tribunal was established in 2007, since when several hundred 
such tribunals have been set up across the country. And in June 2014, the Supreme People's Court of China set up its own Environment and Resources Tribunal to hear cases itself and supervise the work of the lower specialist courts and tribunals. Now, the traditional courts have given a lead. Best known, perhaps, are the cases in the Indian Supreme Court, many initiated by the great environmental advocate M.C. Mehta. They have made orders, for example, to oversee the cleaning up of industrial pollution threatening the Taj Mahal, to reduce air pollution in Delhi by conversion of all buses from diesel fuel to compressed natural gas. So also in the Philippines in 2008, the Supreme Court issued a continuing mandamus against 10 government agencies to secure the cleaning up of Manila Bay and requiring them to make quarterly reports to the court. Three years on in 2011, the Chief Justice and other justices were reported as taking a tour of the bay to inspect progress for themselves. There have been plenty of examples from this side of the world. A famous case concerned the heavily polluted Riachuela River in Buenos Aires. Lovers of, of, lovers of Latin American music will recall that the mist over the Riachuela had been immortalized by the 1937 tango of that name, La Niebla del Riachuela. But the mist was not as romantic as it seemed. It was largely due to industrial pollution. More accurately, perhaps, the song had spoken of the river as a grim cemetery of ships, Torvo Cementerio de Naves. The 1994 Constitution had guaranteed the right to a healthy and balanced environment fit for human development. In 2008, in a case brought by a group of local residents, the Supreme Court, under Chief Justice Lorenzetti, decided to give effect to that right. It ordered the various government agencies, federal and local, to develop a coordinated plan under court supervision to clean up the river and the surroundings. To assist this task, the court involved a variety of different agencies, including the Ombudsman, NGOs, and the National Audit Office. In practical terms, it led to the approval in 2011 of an integrated environmental cleanup plan with a 15-year $1.8 billion program for improving the river, the local industries, and the conditions of the residents of the 13 slums along its banks. The court also accepted the need for continuing supervision with annual public hearings in the court for officials to report on progress. There are plenty of other examples from around the world. For those who like a colorful version of their legal history, I commend Oliver Hooke's book, Taking Back Eden, Eight Environmental Cases That Changed the World. His eight cases are taken from USA, Japan, Philippines, Quebec, India, Russia, Greece, and Patagonia. Their title may perhaps claim a little too much, but they provide illustrations of judicial effectiveness in practice in a wide variety of legal situations. I come to perhaps the most important challenge of all, climate change. Here, a judicial decision, this time from the US Supreme Court, may truly have changed the course of history and the world. This is the remarkable 2007 judgment in Environmental Protection Agency v. Massachusetts. In simple terms, the court decided by a five to four majority that the authorities' powers under the Clean Air Act extended to greenhouse gas emissions, such as CO2 emissions from motor vehicles. In the face of the unchallenged evidence from the petitioners of a strong consensus that global warming threatens a precipitate rise in sea levels by the end of the century and severe and irreversible changes to natural ecosystems, the agency's failure to take any action was held to be arbitrary and capricious and therefore unlawful. The difference between the majority and the minority in that case did not turn on the reality of the threat but in the interpretation of the Clean Air Act and on the role of the court itself. In his dissent, Chief Justice Roberts suggested that the petitioner's true goal in the litigation may be more symbolic than anything else. He said the constitutional role of the courts was to decide concrete cases, not to serve as a convenient forum for policy debates. 
However, as we now know, the petitioner's victory in the Massachusetts case was far from purely symbolic. Following a change of administration in the United States, it provided the legal basis for the strong climate change policies developed by the new President Obama and for his leadership of the global effort efforts to achieve agreement in Paris. It may come to be seen as a lucky history, or, uh, as a lucky accident of history and timing that the majority judgment went the way it did, when it did, that it was followed by a presidency which was able and willing to exploit it to the full, and that, it came, and that he came at a time when the global community was ready to respond. The Paris Agreement of December 2015 was an extraordinary achievement. Perhaps the most important thing that came out of Paris was the global consensus on the reality and urgency of climate change as a common concern of mankind requiring an effective and progressive response. That degree of international consensus accepted by almost 196 national governments, that is virtually the whole of the world community, is surely unprecedented. Almost as, un as remarkable as the agreement itself was the speed with which it was brought into effect. That required ratification by at least 55 parties representing 55% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The threshold was reached at the beginning of October 2016, and the agreement came into effect a month later on the 4th of November. This is not the place to discuss the detail of the agreement, nor is it the place to discuss the impact of the attempted change of direction by the current US president. Personally, I do not believe that one person, however powerful, can reverse the momentum created by Paris. I prefer, prefer the view of Jacob Worksman, who took part in the Paris process as principal advisor on climate change for the European Commission. He described the agreement as one of the most robust and comprehensive transparency and accountability frameworks of any international environmental agreement. He spoke optimistically of a unique compromise in which international obligations to prepare, communicate, pursue, account for, track, and successively and progressively update targets will, in the bright light of regular international attention and in the heat of a warming planet, sink deep roots into domestic legal and political systems. I am confident that he will be proved right. So, to conclude, what lies ahead? Some of you may have read Clive Ponting's almost ap apocalyptic vision of our future in his book, A New Green History of the World, The Environment and the Collapse of Great Civilizations. There is not much cause in the book for optimism. Ponting shows how many of the great civilizations over the last 5,000 years have been destroyed by over-exploitation of their environment and how we risk suffering the same fate. They range from the Sumerians 3,000 years before the Christian era to the Mayas in South America in the early centuries of our own era and more recently the ill-fated inhabitants of Easter Island. Their massive monuments still gaze into the future. They seem perhaps to symbolize the uncertainties of our own age but those monuments on Easter Island conceal their own destructive power. It is now thought that to provide rollers and scaffolds necessary to move and erect them, the islanders destroyed most of the trees which were essential to the island's ecology. Ponting sees lessons for us today. He says, like Easter Island, the earth has only limited resources to support society. Like the islanders, the human population of the earth has no practical means of escape. Now, in the same period of 5,000 years, on one view, humanity has been astonishingly successful. World population has grown from a mere 15 million in 3,000 BC to over 7 billion today, the vast majority in the last two centuries. But at the same time, we have built up for ourselves and our fellow creatures environmental problems of an unprecedented scale and complexity. One cause for hope is that unlike those civilizations, we have the understanding or the means of understanding what is happening and what we can do about it. On the science, there is a remarkable degree of consensus. The problem is to translate 
that understanding into political action. Here, above all, we may find ourselves looking to the law to provide a bridge and to the judges to offer at least some of the building blocks. Thank you very much. Thank you.